When I saw the cleansing fountain Open wide for all my sin I obeyed the Spirit's wooing When he said, Wilt thou be clean? I will praise him I will praise him Praise the Lamb for sinners slain Give him glory, all ye people For his blood can wash away each stain Though the way seems straight and narrow All I claimed was swept away My ambitions, plans, and wishes At my feet in ashes lay I will praise him, I will praise him Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Then God's fire upon the altar of my heart was set aflame. I shall never cease to praise him. Glory, glory to his name. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away each stain. Blessed be the name of Jesus, I'm so glad He took me in. He's forgiven my transgressions, He has cleansed my heart from sin. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away each stain. Glory, glory to the Father, Glory, glory to the Son, glory, glory to the Spirit, glory to the three in one. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away each stain. Amen, and welcome to the Old Landmark Missionary Baptist Bible Trail. This is the Bible study program of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas. Well, today is going to be a little bit different from our normal program. Um, this program's primary purpose is to serve as a wagon train uh, through the Word of God. You know, back in the olden days, there was an Oregon Trail where wagon trains would go from the east all the way across the continent to the Oregon Territory. It was a vast journey. But, you know, every so often they would stop and they take a little bit of a break from their traveling. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a little break break today from the Gospel of John, and we're going to have a doctrinal question and answer lesson. Um, I want you to understand you are invited uh, throughout the week as our programs are posted to YouTube or to Facebook. If you have a question about a lesson or you have a Bible question in general about any doctrine or scripture or topic, go ahead and list that uh, in the comment section either on YouTube or on Facebook and I'll do my best to get to it and answer it from the Word of God. I can't promise you that I'll have all the answers. You know, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. There's some things we just don't have answers on, but I'll surely do my best. Uh, for today, we're going to be in a doctrinal lesson book called the 52 Doctrinal Lessons. This is a little book written by a great Baptist preacher scores and scores of years ago. His name was Ben Bogard. And uh, 
the thing I like about this little book is that it does not tell you what to believe. It does not tell you what Bible doctrine is. It simply asks questions and gives you Bible scriptures to go and answer the question from the Bible yourself. This is the best book that there is to find doctrine. That, that's what this book is profitable for as we're going to see. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and have an opening prayer and then we'll have one more hymn and then we'll get into our lesson. Lord Jesus, I thank you so very much for your precious word. I thank you, dear God, for the teachings that are so clearly revealed, teachings about you yourself, teachings about salvation, teachings about the church, and how we are to live our lives and serve you. And I just pray, dear God, that today as we have this doctrinal study, as we take this Sabbath break from our wagon trail through your word, that we would would would, would draw strength from your word and that we would learn something today that would help us to be better and more faithful Christians. Please continue to be with all those who are on our prayer list who are in need of your help, those that are sick from this COVID-19, those that are dealing with the loss of loved ones, those that are, are dealing with trials and tribulations that have lost their jobs or, or having other difficulties, those that are in spiritual uh, chaos. Dear God, I just pray that your hand would be upon them all. And Lord, may this program be a blessing to those who are watching it. Forgive us of our sins. If there's anyone who's listening who's not saved, I pray that they might hear the gospel and be saved. All these things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. For our next hymn. By the way, that hymn I just, sung, I just sang was the one I couldn't sing yesterday. So I finally learned it a little bit better and sang it for you. So our next song is going to be See where we're at. Eternal Father, strong to save. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth bind the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to Thee for those in peril on the sea. Oh, Savior, whose almighty word the winds and waves submissive heard, who walkest on the foaming deep and calmly in its rage did sleep. Oh, hear us when we cry to Thee for those in peril on the sea. Oh, Holy Spirit, who didst brood upon the waters dark and rude, and bid their angry tumult cease, and give for wild confusion peace. Oh, hear us when we cry to Thee for those in peril on the sea. Oh, Trinity of love and power, our brethren shield in dangers are from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go. Thus evermore shall rise to thee glad hymns of praise from land and sea. Amen. All right. Well, the subject of our Bible study today is doctrine. Doctrine is a word that means teaching. Christianity is a faith that requires teaching. Before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he left his local New Testament church with a commission. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
Amen. Now the first word for teach there means to make disciples. It's talking about soul winning. It's talking about leading people to the Lord, telling them the gospel, telling them about Jesus so that they can be saved. But the second word there is talking about instruction. Doctrine is what we're supposed to teach. Now there are many so-called churches in the world today that say things like that, this. We don't teach doctrine. Well, first of all, if you don't teach doctrine, you don't teach anything because doctrine is what is taught. But often what they mean when they say we don't teach doctrine is we don't teach anything dogmatically. And a lot of times the reason that they have that attitude is because they don't want to run people off. All they care about is getting people in the door, getting people in the pews, and getting people to put money in the offering plate. And so they won't take a stand on things like, you know, once saved, always saved, or losing your salvation. They won't take a stand on whether or not supernatural spiritual gifts are, are still in the, uh, in, you know, in effect today, or whether they've ceased, as the Bible teaches. Uh, they won't take a stand on whether or not man has free will, or, or whether he doesn't. They, they try to be as, as open and as non-committal as they can, and as a result, their teaching is watered down. It's what I like to call a hot tub Christianity, a cotton candy gospel that in the end you boil it down to this. You're already saved. You don't. You just don't know it. Be happy. Sit down. Be glad. And, uh, you know, continue to come and put money in our offering plate. Well, listen, we're not called to water down the Word of God. We are called to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And we're going to demonstrate today from the Word of God and using the, the questions that we have here and the Scriptures, we're going to show that the Bible is a book of doctrine and that we are called as New Testament Christians to dispense doctrine. And so the first question that Brother Bogart asks here in his lesson book is, did Christ have a doctrine? And so I invite you to open up to Mark chapter number 1. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter number 1, and we're going to read verses 22 through 27. My goodness, I'm all over the place today. Mark chapter number 1. Let's read verses 22 to 27. It says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And so it's very clear that Christ had a doctrine. Christ had specific teachings that he taught. And what we see is that his performance of miracles proved that he was indeed um, preaching the truth. That was the purpose of miracles in the New Testament. You know, I, got a, I can preach a whole sermon on miracles in the Bible. Most people think that miracles are very commonplace uh, back during Bible times. You've got to realize Bible times covered a long period of time. It covered, you know, all the way from, uh, you know, when Adam was created many thousands of years ago, all the way to... Uh, you know, when, when uh, the New Testament was written. And in all that time, miracles were only commonplace for about 200 years total. You had miracles during the days of Moses and Elijah. And then hundreds of years later, during the days of Elijah and Elisha. 
And then hundreds of years later during the days of Jesus Christ and the apostles. You add those three eras up, you get about 200 years. The rest of the time, miracles were few and far between. The purpose of miracles back in the day before the Bible was written, before the Bible was completed, was to confirm the word that was preached. So Jesus' teaching, Jesus' doctrine was proved true by his performance of miracles. Now notice what they said about Jesus here. Let's look at it again. It says they were astonished, verse 22, Mark 1, 22, they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You know, Jesus preached it like it was. I had a, a preacher friend of mine, one of my mentors, told me that years ago after church he was standing at the, the door of the church house greeting people as they were leaving after the sermon and he had a man that had been visiting the church and he said to him, Preacher, I, I like what you preach but one thing I don't like is that you preach it that that's the only way that it is. Well, you know, that, 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 that it's, it's that way or it's no way. And that's how God has called us to preach. If I'm not certain that the Bible teaches something, i got no business preaching it. But if I am convinced by the Word of God that something is true, I should preach it boldly and I should preach it with all my heart. I would not be a faithful preacher if I did not. All true preachers are to be teachers of the divine book. They need to study and they need to, to take the, the word of God into their hearts and they need to be able to present it confidently and boldly. Now, some people will say, well, it's just not possible to know if doctrine is right or not. They'll say it's arrogant to say that your doctrine is correct. Really, look at Job chapter number 11 and verse 4. Job chapter number 11 and verse 4. Now, one thing we know about Job is that he was a, an upright man. Um, he was accused by a lot of people of, 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 of doing evil secretly, and some people thought that's why he was suffering. Of course, we know that, that Job was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. He was a very righteous man. He wasn't sinless, but he was a very godly man. He hadn't done anything wrong. He got he, The reason that he was going through all that suffering in the book of Job was for the glory of God. That's a whole other subject. But I want you to look at what Job said in Job 11 and verse 4. It was said of Job, For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. Job is someone who claimed that his doctrine was pure. And I make the same claim to you here today. I don't mean it arrogantly. I don't mean it uh, proudly. But I believe with all my heart that the doctrines I preach out of this book are true because I see them in this book. I tell the folks at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church all the time, I don't want you to believe something just because I said it. I want you to test it. I want you to be there as a group of people called Barians. They were called more noble than those of Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures to see whether these things were so. And I ask you to do the same thing. Don't believe something just because Brother BJ says so. Believe it because the Bible says it. This is where the authority lies. But Job was convinced that what he taught was pure. He was convinced that when he taught, when he preached, it was absolutely true. I want us to see next that the apostles had a doctrine. Look at Acts 2.41. Acts chapter number 2 and verse 41. Our lesson might go a little bit longer today because I want to get through this whole lesson. It is Saturday, so you may have a little extra time. You may pause the video and, and watch the second part later. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I want to get through this whole thing. But Acts chapter number 2. And verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then go to verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So the apostles had a doctrine. They had specific teachings that they taught. It was called the apostles' doctrine here in the book of Acts, once again, because the New Testament had not been completed. How do people know in those days that the doctrine was true? Well, because the apostles taught it. And God gave the apostles and various other people powers to perform miracles to prove it. 
How do you know that what I or any preacher today preaches is true? You test it against the Word of God. Back then it was called Apostles' Doctrine. Today we call it Bible Doctrine. But it is the teachings of God that are true. Now let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Doctrine must have a source. And as we said, the source for Christian doctrine, the source for Bible doctrine is the Word of God, which is the Bible. Now, there are groups that will say, yes, the Bible is the Word of God. Yes, the Bible contains doctrine. But then they'll say, the Bible is not the only source of doctrine. Um, you know, they will say that, well, you know, maybe uh, these other writings by some church is equal to the Bible or, or, or is, is, it contains more doctrine than what's revealed in the Bible. Or maybe some special teacher. You know, there, there's some people who say that the Pope has the power to speak from the chair and to, 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 to lay down doctrine or some church council may able to be able to lay down doctrine. Um, you know, the, the Seventh-day Adventists believe that, I believe it was a woman named Ellen G. White, they believe that her writings are equal to Scripture. Um, the the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower cult, they believe that their magazines and their writings and so forth or anything that comes from the leadership of their organization is basically on par with Scripture as I understand. Sometimes these groups change their beliefs. But what I want us to see today very clearly is that the Scriptures are our sole rule of faith and practice and they are profitable for doctrine. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture, this is 2 Timothy 3 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's break this down. First of all, all Scripture is inspired. There's not some parts of the Bible that are uninspired and some parts that are. There, there are some people, they want to say, well, this part's inspired and this part's not. Usually they say that because there's part of the Bible they don't like. Or there's part of the Bible they don't want to follow because it irks them or it, it goes against them. It convicts them of their sin. And so they just conveniently say the parts that they don't like aren't inspired and the parts that they do like are. Well, folks, that's blown out of the water. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration, you know, there's different people mean different things when they mean inspiration. Here's what it means in the Bible. It means God breathed. Yes, men physically wrote down the, the Bible. The words of the Bible. But it was the Holy Spirit of God that worked through them, that guided them, that superintended them as they wrote down the revelation of God. God allowed their individual personalities to show through. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can tell there's differences. You can tell Matthew was written by an educated tax collector. You can tell that Luke was written by an educated doctor. You can tell that John was written by an uneducated fisherman. Their personalities show through in their vocabulary and the simplicity or the complexity of, of their speech. And that's just simple um, examples right there with just the Gospels. But even though God allowed their individual personalities to show through, even though he allowed them to, to, to put their own stamp, so to speak, on the writings, it was God who was ultimately behind it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then it says, is profitable. Profitable for what? The first thing that's listed is doctrine. Teaching. What does the Bible teach about God? What does the Bible teach about angels? What does the Bible teach about Jesus? What does the Bible teach about the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible teach about salvation? What does the Bible teach about sin? What does the Bible teach about the last days? And so forth. The answer to these questions are found in the Word of God. It is profitable for doctrine. And then it says for reproof and for correction. Those words are kind of related and I've always looked at it like this the word of God one of its uses is for us to reprove others when they do wrong now listen Jesus said judge not lest you be judged and when he said that what he meant was don't condemn somebody don't put yourself in God's place and hand out punishment yourself or have the attitude that you would hand out punishment if you could and 
You know, Jesus said in another place, when you judge, judge righteously. It's not condemnation for me to tell you what the judge has said. God has called us to preach the truth. God has called us to preach against sin. God has called us to preach righteousness. That's going to rub some people the wrong way. And yes, I freely admit, I too am a sinner. I am a sinner saved by grace. But nonetheless, it is my duty as a New Testament preacher, if you're a saved person and a member of a true New Testament church, it's your job to preach preach righteousness and to tell people about uh, the, 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 the Word of God and to witness and to be a light and an example. You don't have to reprove people in a spirit of meanness. I've known some preachers who are brick throwers, who are flame throwers. They preach about hell, and I do too, but I tell people I deserve to go there just as much as anybody. There's some preachers I've heard it sounds like they can't wait to see people thrown in there. God don't want nobody to go to hell. We preach about it to warn people because we don't want them to go there. So the scriptures are good for reproof. They're also good for correction. Once again, reproof, correction kind of go together. I believe reproof, I'm reproving other people, but correction myself. When I read the Word of God, it corrects me. When I read the Word of God, it convicts me when I do wrong. The Word of God, we'll see, is like a mirror that shows us uh, how we look to God. It says, it goes on, it says, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible tells us what's right and wrong. The Bible tells us what to do and how God wants us to do it. And here's verse 17. Remember I said, there's some people, there's some people who will say that uh, there is doctrine to be found outside of the Bible. Maybe it's what some council of a church says. Maybe it's what the Pope says. Maybe it's what Ellen G. White says or, or whoever. But they, they say there's more doctrine than what's in the Bible. You need more is what they say. The Bible's good, they'll say, but you need more. No. Look at verse 17. The, all Scripture, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now skip down to verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. Not perfect as in sinless, but complete. Meaning the Bible gives me everything I need to be a man of God. The Bible gives me everything I need to be a faithful disciple. I don't need anything else. Anything else would be superfluous. Think about it like this. The Bible is perfect because it's given by inspiration of God. It's inerrant. It's infallible. The Bible is perfect. Anything you add to perfection takes away from its perfection. You can't take away from perfection and you cannot add to perfection without changing something from being perfect. The Bible is perfect and it gives us all that we need to be faithful Christians. It says thoroughly furnished. That means perfectly equipped unto all good works. The Bible empowers us and teaches us what we need in order to be um. Faithful and fully equipped Christians. Now, I do believe we will go ahead and call it quits there because I'm only part way through this lesson and we'll be here forever um, if we keep going. And I don't want to overload you. So I want you to be able to process what we have uh, looked at here today. I want you to understand today and carry this away. There is such a thing as true doctrine. There is such a thing as perfect doctrine. And that doctrine is found in the Word of God. It's not hidden in some code. It can be understood if you will simply read the Bible with an open heart and an open mind. And you need to be saved. I'll tell you that because the Holy Spirit will give you illumination. So there is good doctrine. Next Saturday, a week from now, we'll pick up on this lesson and we'll see that there is such a thing as bad doctrine. And that's something that we need to be aware of. But at this time, we'll have a closing prayer and then we'll have a closing hymn. Lord Jesus, I thank you so very much for the truths of your word. I thank you, dear God, for making it possible for us to read the Bible and to understand it. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us the courage to preach it, whatever it says. Give us the, the, the wisdom to stay away from false doctrine, to discern what is true and what is not. And Lord, just help us to live these things out in our lives, not to just be a head knowledge, but to be a, a heartfelt experience. Let it have an effect in the way we live our lives for you. Forgive us of our sins. All these things we ask in your holy and most precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now for our final hymn. Let's see. For our closing hymn, 
Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Bear me through the swelling current, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. I will ever give to thee. One last thing, my friend. If you're under the sound of my voice, you have never received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. I want you to know that He's the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins because He loved you. He rose again from the dead on the third day. And right now, full and free, He offers salvation to you. If you will simply go to Him and ask forgiveness for your sins and ask Him to come into your heart to forgive your sin, to save your soul, the Bible says He will save you and He will save you forever. It's all by grace through faith. Just receive the gift of eternal life from Jesus in prayer. He loves you. I want to thank you for being with us today. Um, tomorrow, we're not going to have the Through the Bible um, program that we're doing here. We're not going to have our, uh, our, back to our Bible Trail program. But on this channel, we will upload the services of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church of Wichita, Kansas for the Lord's Day. And I'll be back with you on this program Monday. God bless you. God keep you. God watch over you and protect you and your family. We love you and thank you for being with us. God bless.